Hello, everybody, and welcome to another online seminar presented by Head Acoustics. My name is Jacob Sondergaard, and I'll be your host today. Today's topic is something that we're calling ANC headset testing, making sense of the noise. And uh, the whole idea with today's session is that not that long ago, we got together with the awesome team at headfi.org to take the very best ANC headsets that we could find and put them through their paces. We wanted to test these headsets to see how their performance stacked up in terms of a few additional parameters beyond what people normally look at. And I guess what it boils down to is that we wanted to answer this question. How do we properly evaluate and recommend ANC headsets? Uh, we feel like the question here is more relevant now than at any point prior because headsets are getting increasingly more smart and sophisticated. They're getting broader use case scenarios and there are very few measurement solutions that address all the scenarios. Uh, in any case, when looking at traditional headphones, consumers can read reviews online, they can look at frequency response measurements, THD distortion, uh, to get some idea uh, of the performance. And in some cases, if they're lucky, they can actually go to a physical store, try them on and listen to them. And that's great. Uh, but what it boils down to is really what Floyd Toole wrote in 2009, which is, and I quote, frequency response is the single most important aspect of the performance of any audio device. If it is wrong, nothing else matters, end quote. So that's all good and well, but the real question is, is that sufficient for something like an ANC headset? Does that encompass everything that we want to do? Now, many consumer headphones today you know, typically incorporate microphones and therefore really should be classified as headsets. And uh, as a consequence of including that microphone, they can also take advantage of the mic path to include uh, use case scenarios like the three that we have described here, ANC performance, sort of the very typical block everything out. That's the first use case we want to explore today. Number two is using that same microphone to include something called talk-through mode or transparency as it's sometimes known. And then the third use case is using the microphone for, oddly enough, voice call performance if you are connected to a mobile phone. But, you know, if you're in the, in the shoes of a, of a user or a consumer and you're trying to figure out how could you possibly evaluate these features if you're trying on headphones in a store or you're lucky enough to have them on a short-term loan from from a store, from a buddy, how do you go about doing that? You know, at a minimum, it, re it would require the help of a, a buddy who has a very critical listening skills that's able to relay back to you and then setting up some sophisticated demos and trials in order to get anywhere close to it. Now, of course, Head Acoustics has a measurement solution that can address all of these use cases and many more for that matter. Because ANC headset testing has come a long way. Uh, it's not that many years ago where people would take a single loudspeaker, maybe two loudspeakers, put them in a room, play some pink noise, and then look at the level at the eardrum when you measure um, without headset, with a headset on in passive mode and a headset on in active mode, and then maybe also look at the uh, spectra that we get from that to determine how much ANC are we getting, and then basing their judgments off of that. Now, today, we're using something like what you're seeing here in the block diagram. Uh, we're using the, on the left-hand side, Aqua to control the lab core interface that communicates with the head and torsos, plural. Uh, we're using a network simulator that makes a phone call to a mobile phone that pairs up to the uh, device on the test, the headphone, because many headphones today have apps where we can control features and settings that allows us to do cool things without actually physically touching the headphones while they're in the chamber. And then on the right-hand side, we're using our eight microphone and eight speaker background noise uh, recording and reproduction system called 3Pass that allows us to take any real-world scenario and bring it back to the lab and reproduce it in an orally accurate manner. And when it comes to state-of-the-art ANC headset testing, one additional thing that is very important to mention for us is that it requires something a little bit more sophisticated than just looking at overall dB attenuation numbers and spectra. So just like this lady here on the left-hand side of your slide is 
unsatisfied with the soup, as the waiter walks up and says, well, it's the right temperature. Yes, okay, temperature is an important component in creating a bowl of soup, but does it tell us everything about the tastes and the flavors of that soup? Far from it. And it is, in our opinion, similar when you're doing things like evaluating ANC performance of a headset. If you're just looking at the amount of dB attenuation that you are getting out of your headphones, does that tell us anything about whether that attenuation is effective and meaningful and what the overall perceived levels are from a real user perspective? Far from it. So as the slide states, the state-of-the-art ANC headset testing requires psychoacoustics and hearing models. So of course we cover the basics. We can do that. We incorporate that into our testing, but what we're very keen on promoting are some of these additional factors. We've listed five really important factors and metrics that we want to um, just leave here as sort of a uh, reference slide and a little bit of a, a um, anchor for us to go back to and refer to later on. Uh, but I'll go through them real fast. The first one we want to highlight is the Speech Intelligibility Index, which is standardized in ANSI S3.5. And sort of ironically, despite its name, Speech Intelligibility Index, what SII really does is it qualifies the speech environment, or rather the noise environment, where speech is supposed to take place. So the way that we're using SII for judging ANC performance is we're still looking at the residual noise at the eardrum when we have no headset and headset in passive mode and headset in active mode. But now we're looking at that residual noise, according to SII, how impactful would that noise be if we were to have communication in that environment. So it's taking a look at the noise and instead of just looking at a single dB number, we're now looking at that noise from the perspective of uh, hearing models and psychoacoustics and how it would interfere with general communication. Now the next one on the list is Swicker Loudness as standardized in ISO 532-1. And really as this block says, what Swicker Loudness does is it's a convenient way for us to order complex sounds of various levels and spectra on a scale of subjective magnitude. So sort of akin to what SII is trying to do, Swicker Loudness allows us to, at least in the frequency domain, apply the correct weighting functions, masking effects, et cetera, of the human hearing system to a degree that allows us to then speak more meaningful about whether the impacts that we have made through our ANC systems, actively or passively, is actually meaningful from a, a human ear and a human hearing perspective. Now, the next three are going to be uh, MOS metrics. So MOS, of course, stands for Mean Opinion Scores. And uh, in short, the best way for me to uh, summarize a mean opinion score metric or algorithm is to say that they're all based on subjective jury studies done at some point in time. And the algorithm themselves are going to be a uh, replication of that jury study and essentially give you the same output as if you were to conduct a jury study. Now, the crucial thing to note with these algorithms is they're based on the original jury study, which means the algorithms can only ever be as good as the original jury study and really only function when they work within the parameters and constraints of the original jury study. So in short, MOS metrics are really a way to shortcut the process of asking 300 people to come in and listen to your product or listen to your sample and asking them for a feedback and taking an average of all that. That's what the MOS metrics do. However, because they're all dependent and originates from in individual jury studies, they are only applicable within those constraints, which is why there are many different MOS metrics out there. And there's really three that we want to emphasize and use for the work that we'll uh, be looking at today. And the first one here, listening effort. It's standardized in SCTS 103.558. In short, what it looks at is the perceived listening effort in speech communication scenarios when there is near and ambient noise. So that to a T almost addresses the uh, talk through mode example, right? Lots of near end noise and we're trying to understand some type of speech and sometimes uh, some type of um, communication. Polka, a little bit different. Polka looks at the speech quality in telephony systems and crucially 
is not applicable for noisy situations, but it's something that we would use to, trans to evaluate the speech quality transmission of a headset in quiet conditions. So we'll draw on that later on in, in the third use case scenario. And 3Quest, it's a little bit akin to Polka, but uh, it does differ because it evaluates the speech quality while in the presence of background noise. However, it is specifically geared towards what we would call uplink or sending direction. So when you're evaluating the mic path, for instance, on an ANC headset. So all of these standards, many of them are freely available. Some of them you have to pay for, but we leave this here for you guys to note them down and if needed to go and search for them, read them, study them, and make sure that you're up to speed on the types of terminology and the types of methods that we're using. Now, I think we should get ready for testing. That's what we're here for. So in cooperation with headfi.org, we were able to get a whole bunch of nice and fantastic headphones. And we tested a lot of them and we have selected a subset of those to be used for today's session. The first part, as we mentioned, is ANC performance. This is the most traditional type of testing. It's simply where we blast the headset with a variety of noises and then we look at how good the headsets are uh, actively, passively, total attenuation wise in blocking out the outside world. The key difference with what we do, uh, I would sum up as that we use realistic noises that are recorded and then equalized using what we call the MSA, the microphone surround array um, and the three pass system. And then we also interpret our results using psychoacoustics and hearing models to gather more insight into the actual performance of the device. So here is a very traditional way of presenting ANC performance. What we're looking at here is the pink noise level at the ears of a head and torso with no headset on minus the pink noise level at the ears with the headset on and ANC on, so max attenuation. That delta level, somewhere between what looks like 14 and 24 dB, is going to be the attenuation. It's a very typical way of presenting it, a single number attenuation. We've, we've uh, at the bottom, indicated the noise scenario. It's pink noise. Now, some things to be cautious of here when people just present a single number is, is there any weighting applied to these numbers? And in this case, you can see there's a weighting applied to these numbers that might make a difference. Sometimes there's band limitation during the playback, during the analysis, it's uncertain. Uh, in this case, we can share that we're doing a full audio band 20 hertz to 20K analysis, so that we're capturing anything that theoretically would be captured by the human ear as well. And the five headphones that we ended up selecting for this study, they're all over the ear or sometimes known as circumoral headsets. And all of them are quote unquote premium headphones. They're all priced at $300 or more in the United States. And uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, indication of what these headphones are, where they come from rather, uh, headphone one, four, and five, they're relatively new to the over ear ANC game, whereas headphone two and headphone three, well, those manufacturers, they've been in the business for quite a while. Now, you might look at that chart and think that's kind of odd the way that Head Acoustics decided to rank these products, but it'll make a lot more sense when we click through and we show you how these devices perform in real world conditions, because the first noise condition, as I mentioned, is for pink noise. And very clearly we can see that the devices in pink noise behave vastly different from how they behave in the real world. Now you can look at the, at the bottom along the x-axis of the uh, chart to see the individual noise conditions, their level, a weighted level. So we have an inside bus scenario at 66 dB SPL, a weighted, and then some other noise sources. Those noise sources are chosen because they offer a variety of uh, levels. They also offer a uh, variety of dynamic situations. So airplane is a fairly static noise source, in some sense, a little bit similar to pink noise, but you have things like crossroads, which is sort of like an intersection or a train station with a train pulling in, where there's a lot of activity and dynamic, um, dynamic elements uh, and transients that occur, which you just would not see in a pink noise environment. 
And so in any case, what we're starting to find out based on this is the fact that pink noise can't really be trusted as a noise source when you're evaluating A and C in headphones. So number one, pink noise is not realistic. You just don't run into pink noise in the real world. It's not there, it doesn't happen. And by the looks of it, especially if we look at headphone three, four, and five, uh, it looks like they might be optimized to perform a little better in the pink noise environment versus the real world. So when you use pink noise, number one, and you're evaluating a bunch of headphones, number one, your rank order might change versus real world noise scenarios. And number two, it looks like the ANC might be overestimated for a bunch of your products. So it's a little bit of an unreliable thing, but you can see why we decided to rank the headphones, headphone one through headphone five, because for all our real world scenarios, that's kind of the rank order we get. And so just to make it a little easier for you guys here as we go through the rest of the presentation, there's lots of data and we'll try and stick to this color coding where red bars or red lines indicate headphone two and orange bars, orange lines will indicate headphone four and so on and so forth. Now, of course, people and head acoustics would as well show you how that attenuation is achieved by looking at the spectrum and how the total attenuation is comprised of the individual components. So the passive and the active. So what we're showing you here is for headphone two specifically in the airplane noise scenario. So we're trying to, you know, distance ourselves a little bit from the pink noise. But when we look at the airplane scenario, headphone two does a really uh, excellent job of illustrating the crossover that occurs right around 700 Hertz ish between the active and the passive. So the curves here in blue, at sort of the bottom, that's going to be the total attenuation. You see it's more or less flat across the, uh, the frequency range. And that is because the passive component shown in red offers zero attenuation at the low frequency before the material properties, the mechanical properties of the headphone design starts to kick in and starts to offer more and more attenuation as we go along certainly above six, 700 Hertz and it offers great attenuation. And then also a big contributor is the active portion. So probably knowing the manufacturer, knowing the amount of attenuation we're getting here, a combination of feed forward and feedback A and C is applied that's shown in green. And you can see how it's very effective at lower frequencies, peaking somewhere around 225 Hertz, but then it rolls off and you get that crossover right at 700 Hertz. So that would be a very typical way to also evaluate ANC systems and ANC performance. And uh, I know there's a lot of data here to digest, but really what we want to show you on the big graph on the right hand side is the total attenuation for airplane noise scenarios for all five of our chosen headphones. And then on the left hand side in the smaller charts, you'll see top left is going to be the active component only. And the bottom left is going to be the passive component only. If we just, you know, a couple of things that we can extract from this. The passive component more or less looks like they're following the same line. Some headphones are maybe a little thicker, or a little bit better isolating than others, but more or less the same trend and the same breakpoints around 350 Hertz ish. If you look at the active component, well, there is a big difference in how they perform. And then sure enough, when you look at the total amount of attenuation, looking at it from a spectral perspective, we get more or less the same ranking as we would by looking at it uh, using a single dB attenuation number. So far, so good. I hope you're with me, but let's take a look at something called a quality pi. So in ITUT P505, there's a standard um, that describes how to display a lot of information. That's what we call a quality pi. It's this pie chart we're showing here. And what we're trying to do now is by using headphone two as an example, we're trying to convey a lot of data in a condensed format that takes advantage of our visual cortex properties in the brain so that we can easily compare lots of products side by side. So the core principle of the quality pie is that the larger or longer the slice is and correspondingly the darker green or rather let's start with just getting to green and then darker green, the, the higher the value, the better the performance is. The smaller the slice, the more yellow, orange, and even red the slice is, the worse the performance is. 
Now, specifically for this example, we're highlighting it because we'll go through each slice to give, just to give you a sense of the type of analysis that we're doing. So uh, we have, in my opinion, very helpfully indicated that we're doing four different properties. If you start at the 12 o'clock point on the slice and read around to about four o'clock, you can see we're doing four different parameters in pink noise. And then we're doing the same four parameters in bus indicated by the school bus yellow. And then sky blue indicates we're doing airplane noise, but the same four parameters. So let's just use pink noise to go through the four different parameters. The first one we're looking at is just the total loudness reduction or perceived loudness reduction, because we're looking at this from uh, using Swicker loudness. Now, Swicker loudness is just an example of uh, one potential hearing model. More Glassberg is another one that I know is pretty popular. But the point is, we're already looking at the attenuation that we achieve, the total attenuation, active plus passive, from a psychoacoustic perspective. So the correct reading functions and uh, masking effects have already been applied. Then we do the same thing in the second slice here, but now we're only looking at the active component. So we would expect the active obviously to be less than the total, but we still have a certain minimum benchmark that we would like to achieve for the active in order to consider it a successful or a well-performing device. And when it comes from a consumer perspective, the biggest gains you're going to get in total perceived attenuation is going to be on the active side. Of course, you can make massive blocks to put on people's heads, but that's not going to be comfortable and people probably wouldn't wear that. But you can achieve quite a lot using DSP. So we really want to monitor what's happening with the active portion. That's that two o'clock slide uh, slice in the pie. At three o'clock, we then move to the speech intelligibility index for ANC off. So now, again, we're applying SII to characterize the noise at the ear with the ANC off to say, how easy would it be? And in this case, for pink noise for headphone two, well, it's a little bit poor. It corresponds to 47.4%, but we've marked it here and indicated here. Fortunately for headphone two, when we switch on ANC, our speech intelligibility index goes up. It makes communication, in theory, easier in that environment. So from a psychoacoustic perspective, the ANC is very beneficial. And then rinse and repeat, but for the four different noise scenarios. And as I mentioned, bus noise, much lower level, but it has some dynamic uh, cap uh, parameters or properties to the noise source. And then airplane, which is a very realistic, well, used to be for those of us that flew a lot, but a very realistic noise scenario. Now, all that out of the way, I'm going to throw all these pie charts at you and then without really looking too much at the individual properties, I just want to let your eyes drift across the slide and then figure out where you land because psychoacoustically, just looking at the quality pies, you can see that, well, headphone one almost hits the rails on a lot of these slices in the pie. Lots of green, not a whole lot of red, actually no red at all. Likewise, headphone two does a pretty good job regardless of noise scenario. And then we start to see that little bit of a break. Headphone three lags a little bit behind, four and five. Oh, there's lots of red going on there. We really need to address that. And so hopefully you guys are seeing the same trend. And specifically with headphone five, some of the interesting things that I would like to uh, draw your attention to there is that for the inside bus, and the airplane scenario, so down on the bottom right hand side, you can see that the speech intelligibility index with the ANC off versus ANC on. For both of those noise scenarios, there's a big difference. And unfortunately, the difference points in the wrong direction. So for headphone five, what's that what that is telling us? Is that the ANC is actually making it worse from a psychoacoustic perspective when we switch the ANC on. It's harder to communicate in that environment. Now that completely defeats the purpose of an ANC. And what does that really tell us about the device itself? Now, of course, you know, it's, it's, let's, I don't want to call this it's saving grace, but if you look at the pink noise for speech intelligibility index with ANC off and ANC on, well, it's trending in the right direction. But again, what does that tell us? It's probably an overemphasis on pink noise during the design phase and not real world noise scenarios. What does that tell us from a user and a consumer perspective? 
I'll leave that rhetorical. So what kind of tentative conclusions can we draw from the ANC portion of our test fest? Well, I think both headphone one and headphone two, they do a marvelous job. No matter, no matter which way you slice it, whether you look at traditional metrics, whether you look at psychoacoustic metrics, both headphone one and headphone two do the best job of cuddling you up in your own little acoustic cocoon, just absolutely phenomenal ANC performance. And headphone one clearly gets the nod uh, in, in both traditional and psychoacoustic measures. Headphone three does a very good job, not quite on par with headphone one and headphone two. So we, get, we give that a single plus sign on our little uh, four point scale here of minus two, minus one, plus one and plus two. But to be fair, headphone three does do better than its predecessor. Uh, just to be clear, we didn't share this data here, but I can tell you we tested it. We didn't include it here, but we tested its predecessor and headphone three is doing better. Now headphone four, well, it, it appears to be a very mild a and C implementation, both from a passive and an inactive perspective. But especially if you ignore pink noise, which a lot of people don't, but if you ignore pink noise, uh, headphone four tends to do a little bit better and almost reaches the level of headphone three, but not quite. So we're giving it a single minus sign. There's room for improvement, but you know, it, it, it could be better and it could be a lot worse. Speaking of, well, headphone five, we're gonna give it two minus signs. It really didn't do particularly well at anything. Uh, it, it appears to be very geared towards pink noise. And I think the worst uh, thing that we could say here is that when ANC is switched off in realistic um, noise scenarios, that attenuation is perceived as offering better noise reduction than when ANC is switched on. So that one, is uh, left there at the end with minus two. And you can see the ranking that we ended up with here, headphone one through headphone five, kind of stuck uh, through all the tests and all the parameters here once we got rid of pink noise because headphone five, well, I don't think we need to say more about that. This ranking is going to, or this naming convention is going to stick with us as we move through the test cases because we got to keep going. We have to get to the talk through mode. This is part two. Talk through mode, as I touched on, this is where we look at how transparent the headphones are or the headsets, how well they handle something like uh, external speech from a loudspeaker. So uh, you're talking or you're listening to a, a PA system in an airport lounge or the announcement over a bus or a train carriage, something like that. Now, the test setup for talk through mode is going to differ a little bit, only in the sense that instead of using an external uh, talker represented by a head and torso, we're using an external loudspeaker representing a PA system. Otherwise, we're using Aqua as we know it and 3Pass as we know it to do our analysis and background noise generation, etc. When we look at the talk through mode, before we start applying any noise, the first thing we wanna do is we just wanna look at this in silence and we want to compare the levels and the uh, spectra between the no headset reference condition and the condition when we put the headset on and we put it in talk through mode because that should really be our benchmark. And what we want to see is ideally, we don't change the level at all. We don't touch the level and we don't touch the spectrum, especially in the core speech areas between 200 hertz and 6 kilohertz. Our idea of transparency or talk through mode means that you can clearly understand what somebody else is saying without changing the overall level. So you can see from the chart, we've dropped headphone one for now. Uh, we're looking at headphones two through five only. Headphone two is definitely applying a lot of level changes, which you can also see on the spectrum, the red curve there is hovering towards the bottom. Now, just look again, looking at one number, even though we're looking at perceived uh, loudness reduction on the right-hand side. So we are using Swicker loudness to, to judge the overall loudness delta, uh, even though Headphone two is offering a large amount of attenuation uh, reduction and headphone five is offering very little. 
what we see on the uh, on the graph is that headphone five unfortunately has this uh, tilted bias towards lower frequencies and heavily attenuating higher frequencies. So when you wear them, when you use them and listen to them in talk through mode, everything you hear sounds very muffled and, and, and bassy. It doesn't sound very good at all. And despite headphone two actually offering a lot of loudness reduction, so everything sounds quieter, to be fair, it's more or less spectrally reproduced fairly accurately. So it does sound sort of true but it's heavily reduced and it's very quiet. So in either case, both of them have some work to do. And then just as a sanity check, we measured the side tone again in silence. So side tone, of course, is when we're measuring our own speech. So when we're talking and we're listening to ourselves and we're looking at the comparison between when we do that without headphones on and then when we do it with headphones in talk through mode. Kind of same thing as before. I guess ideally we don't really want to change the overall loudness perception. We want it to sound equally loud. We don't want people to have to change the natural volume when they're talking. But it appears that headphone two is sort of forcing us to speak louder because of the heavy uh, reduction in loudness. And then kind of the same thing. Ideally, we want the uh, spectrum here, especially between 200 hertz and 6K, to stay fairly flat. And um, these past two slides, what they really tell us is that headphone four does a marvelous job of that. Headphone three is pretty good too. And that we can trust the side tone and the external loudspeaker. Both of them give us more or less the same results. So with that being said, let's look at the quality Pi data for talk through mode because this is going to be a little bit different than before and introduces the listening effort metric that we touched on earlier. So as we mentioned, listening effort is used to gauge uh, how much perceived effort needs to be applied to understand speech in the presence of noise. And what we want to do is again use this outer rim here to indicate our noise scenario. So at uh, 12 o'clock and 2 o'clock we're using pink noise and then 4 and 6 we're using school bus yellow. That's the inside bus scenario. And then eight and 10, we're going sky blue for the airplane noise scenario. And all we're looking at here is the listening effort, the MOS score for no headset. So that's a reference baseline condition. And then we put on the headset and we switch the ANC to talk through mode. And what we would like to see is the talk through mode just shining and giving us a perfect five, right? That would be the absolute ideal scenario. We've extracted headphone two here as our example. Uh, not only can you look at the quality pie, we also have the values listed in the table on the right hand side, but clearly for every single noise condition, headphone two is doing something that makes the situation much, much worse. You need to apply a lot more effort to understand what's happening across noise scenarios, not just pink noise. And even if we exclude that for now, inside bus, the situation gets worse. Inside of an airplane, the situation gets worse. Either way, if you keep this in mind, let's switch and show you our four remaining headphones here, headphone two through headphone five. And again, just visually, where do your eyes drift to? And I'd say, look at headphone four, look at headphone three. Both of those have a, uh, they take up the most surface area. They have the largest uh, slices in the pie. They have the most amount of green or rather the least amount of red. Um, compared with things like uh, compared with headphone two and headphone five. And especially when we look at the uh, headphone two, which as we all, I think agreed, offered phenomenal ANC, it's really disappointing to see how it all of a sudden offers a worse experience when we're looking at the uh, talk through mode and we're trying to understand an external loudspeaker. Now, specifically headphone two, we wanted to take a closer look at that headphone. And again, we're using our three noise scenarios indicated by the colors on the outside of the pie chart, but now we're adding two extra slices per condition. What we're looking at now is the listening effort for the ANC off and ANC on, because we wanted to see if there's any difference or if there's anything else going on that we didn't capture by just looking at the no headset reference and the talk through mode. But what this tells us is that there was no clear direction, it appears, 
for how this should be designed because depending on your noise condition, you might find that talk through mode works much better than the ANC on condition, or it's more or less the same, or in some cases, ANC on is better than talk through mode. And almost universally true for all noise conditions, ANC off, so simply putting on the headphones and not having any DSP active actually gives you the best talk through mode experience. So then our question is, what is the idea with implementing and introducing a talk-through mode if the best experience occurs with ANC off altogether? And how would the consumers react to something like this? So where do we stand now when we're looking at just the talk-through mode portion of our ANC headset test fest? Well, headphone two leaves Many questions and lots of room for improvement. Headphone three, uh, really phenomenal job all around, really solid talk-through mode implementation. And I guess the only reason why it doesn't get a full two plus signs is because we are very fond of what headphone four was doing in terms of being really transparent, really sounding excellent, both in the uh, quiet, conditions and in the noisy conditions. It just is a very elegant solution for headphone four um, and a very pleasant surprise considering headphone four is relatively new to this game. Headphone five though, uh, well, you know, there's some incorrect implementation of the talk through mode. There's a lot of attenuation above one kilohertz. Uh, the listening effort doesn't really get any better in talk through mode although not quite as bad as headphone two. So overall ranking is, you know, three and four, probably a slight nod to headphone four, and then two and five, they're kind of duking it out for last place. All right, let's take a look at part three. This is the voice call performance. This is where we're looking specifically at how to characterize the voice call performance in the sending direction or in the uplink direction, because just like you can listen to the to a pair of headphones and, and get a sense of the frequency response. Likewise, you can use your own ears to get a good sense of how the headphone performs from your perspective when you're listening to it. What we would like to do is characterize the headphone for how the far end or the other party would perceive your headphone when you're talking into it. That's a little trickier to do, but using this setup, we are able to accomplish just that. So the only thing that really changes here is we don't have an external talker, loudspeaker, or distractor or anything like that. We're using our background noise system to generate noise where we need to. And otherwise, we're just looking at the voice call performance where we're drawing on international standards for how to do so. So Etsy and 3GPP has lots of great suggestions for and standards for how to do this. And when we look at the quality Pi for voice calls, again, we get the snapshot of the performance. And if we take a look at the parameters in the pie chart, starting at the 12 o'clock slice, going around to seven o'clock, all these parameters also listed in the table here in the, the first seven parameters are going to be indicative of the you know, voice quality, sort of that single direction. I'm just talking to you and how does it sound? So it's sort of a single ended look at the performance and the quality. And then from the eight o'clock to the 11 o'clock slice, we're then looking at the parameters that are very crucial for the conversational aspects of the headphone performance or the headset performance. So we're looking at things like echo, echo cancellation rather using engineering-based metric called TCLW. We're using Equest, which is a MOS metric for evaluating echo, and then also looking at duplexing. Duplexing is a term that means how easy is it to handle audio going both directions at the same time. So we can make jokes about different uh, <laughs> cultural differences about how people talk here and there, but the point is, especially maybe for discerning business users, if they're looking for a great pair of headphones that happens to have ANC and can be used to handle phone calls, how easy would it be to uh, use those headphones for conference calling scenarios where somebody's talking and you would like to be able to barge in or interrupt and, and provide your feedback to a certain point when there's a busy discussion taking place. That's essentially what duplexing is and double talk is. 
So the slice here at the 11 o'clock hour tells us a little bit about how good that is. So like all the other quality pies, what we would like to see is just all green, all big slices, you know, take up the entire area of the quality pie. Now let's go through these in a little bit more detail. So frequency response, I don't think we need a whole lot of detail about what a frequency response is, but the way to read this is that the, uh, the difference here is going to be how far we deviate from the tolerance mask. So in this case, it's a little bit more than 4 dB deviation of fail, in the failing direction from the tolerance mask, hence very red and very small slice. The loudness rating, that is an indication of you know, the level transmission when you're talking into the headphone, and that is very good. In this case, we're looking at headphone two. Idle channel noise, that really just means like the self noise of the mic path. And uh, what we would like to avoid is to have too much uh, attenuation or silence because what you end up with then is complete digital zeros and it sounds like nothingness when, when nobody is talking. But what we would also like to avoid is too much noise on the line. So um, in that case, we go back to almost the, the old analog days of a uh, little bit of background noise the shh, to indicate that a line is open. So headphone two does a marvelous job hitting sort of the sweet spot for idle channel noise and is very good in that sense. Now Polka, this is one of our MOS metrics that we mentioned earlier. Polka indicates the speech quality in the sending direction here in quiet conditions. So no background noise present. We're just talking in phonetically balanced sentences and we're evaluating the speech quality on the far end in the Aqua system using the Polka algorithm. Headphone 2 does not do a good job. It sounds very garbled. In a minute, I can play you an audio sample. You get to hear it for yourself. And then 3Quest, three 3Quest, three as we mentioned, that is the speech quality in the presence of background noise. In the presence of background noise. So now we have crossroads or that intersection noise. You're standing at a corner of a street. You're trying to make a call. How good does it sound? GMOS is the global or overall indication. And then we have NMOS and SMOS that specifically drill into the noise suppression component and the uh, speech quality component. So obviously the higher the scores, the better. And then I touched on the uh, conversational parameters here, TCLW, eQuest, and double talk testing. All right, so let's prepare ourselves for some pie charts. So here are the four different devices we looked at for voice calling. And again, I want to give you guys a couple seconds to scan over each of these quality pies and without really looking at the individual numbers in each of the slices, just look at where's the most green. Where are the biggest slices? And where do your eyes get drawn to? And I know that for me, I immediately gravitate towards headphone three and also headphone four. And then conversely, headphone two and headphone five, but for a lot of the wrong reasons. So without being too harsh, uh, headphone five, uh, I can mention that the frequency response performance is so poor, it's not even indicated by a slice. And that is because uh, the frequency re response failed by about 23 dB. Uh, it looked almost like they, the headphone wasn't tuned for a wideband call. So just to be clear, good point and a good time to mention it, this was all done using a wideband phone call, using the hands-free profile in the Bluetooth SIG codec list, uh, profile list, and using the MSBC codec. And it looked like headphone five just was not designed or tuned for that. It didn't do particularly well. You know, sure enough, uh, speech quality is bad. There's lots of noise. Idle channel noise is, is extremely high. That's why it is very low and very red. On the other hand, let's look at something a little more positive like headphone three. You can see overall, it almost hits the tolerance, the minimum performance mark all the way around the ring. There's a few small areas for improvement, but overall, it's really a really, really good product for voice calling. Now, headphone four, kind of the same thing, except maybe there's a tad too much noise when nobody's talking. So it sounds a little bit more like the old analog phone days with a little bit of background noise uh, on the line itself. So the mic path is a little bit noisy itself. And then the noise suppression itself could have been better. Now, let me just play you two audio samples here. The first one is going to be 
the headphone two. So this is going to be extracted from the polka test itself. It's just a four second utterance that I'll play for you. And then I'll play you exactly the same one for headphone four. You can obviously see that that's kind of the, you know, the edge cases here. This one scoring very low headphone two and headphone four scoring very high. I'll play them back to back and you can listen to them. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. All right, so that was just a four second sample, one utterance. Of course, when we do this, we test much more than just a single utterance, but I think you get the idea. Headphone two sounded a little garbled, almost like there was packet loss in there. It just didn't sound very good. But even though we have exactly the same test setup, test conditions, headphone four actually sounds very good, very nice. Either way, where does that leave us when it comes to evaluating the products? The overall conclusion that we would draw on the voice call aspect would be that just like with talk through mode, headphone two sort of missed the mark a little bit on their voice implementation. The frequency response was off. The noise suppression was not particularly good. Speech quality, as we just heard now, was a little bit garbled, didn't sound very nice. And yes, it'll do fine in terms of echo and, and duplex, and, but most people probably complain that you don't sound particularly nice on that device. Now, you know, just like with headphone three, headphone two has been in the business a while. We actually did also measure its predecessor, and yes, it performed, believe it or not, it did perform better than its own predecessor, so they are heading in the right direction, but there's still a long way to go, especially when we compare it to something like Headphone 3, which really excelled here, really did a wonderful job, uh, much more balanced, uh, really almost hit all of the minimum thresholds all the way around, and it also did much better than its predecessor. Headphone 4 did well, we would say, except maybe you know the noise suppression is a little bit mild, oddly enough, just like its own ANC implementation was a little bit mild, but sort of a little bit of an elegant implementation, a little bit mild implementation. So uh, bottom line is for voice calling alone, I'd say headphone three is the way to go. Headphone four, maybe, um, but headphone two, headphone five, once again, they're duking it out for last place. So how does that, change the way that you view an ANC headset, right? Overall, we are probably left with the idea that headphone three is the best overall headphone, but does it suffer a little bit from the jack of all trades, master of none? Sure, it was, you know, the best at voice calling, but it wasn't quite the best at ANC. It wasn't, you know, it was up there for talk through mode, but maybe not quite the best. Anyway, that's one of the conclusions. The other one, let's look at headphone two. Like there was one of our hands down recommendations if you wanted something for a long flight, if you remember those days, but for other noisy conditions, but people would probably be disappointed with your voice call quality and you would probably be disappointed with the talk through mode. It didn't sound particularly accurate or good. And certainly when noise was introduced, it was exceedingly hard to actually, um, to actually understand anything from the, you know, the PA system that we were simulating with our loudspeaker. Now, headphone four, well, we sort of really liked the implementation that they had here. It was rather smooth and elegant all the way across the board, um, except you know, it didn't quite have that top level ANC. It didn't quite have that top level noise suppression, but if you're talking to somebody that says, you know, I don't really live, work, or travel in very high noise environments, Maybe headphone four is the way to go. And it's certainly worth considering. And then, you know, we didn't mention too many positives about headphone five, and that's maybe with good reason. In our testing here, every data point that we extracted, they didn't really do anything particularly well. So, you know, from this, obviously we walked away from the fact that when you're looking at ANC headphones, of course you should measure the frequency response. That's important. And a lot of people can do that. We can do that too. But you really need to consider all the other use cases, and especially with ANC headphones, the way that they can now do you know, sophisticated ANC implementations. You need real world scenarios to put them in a real world condition. But you also need to look at the talk through mode and you need to consider the voice call performance as well. And especially in the sending direction, because that can be very difficult to evaluate 
as a user if you happen to get your hands on the product. Now, you know, we do that using our three-pass system for the recording of background noise and, and the reproduction of the noise in the lab, and then Aqua with our psychoacoustic packages and our MOS metrics that are all based on standards from around the planet to take a much deeper look and to really evaluate whether all the changes that are being made to the ANC headphone is going to be meaningful. And I think the final point that I just want to leave you guys with is, you know, apart from all the gear and the equipment uh, that we offer at Head Acoustics, we also have an excellent consulting team that's standing by that can help with your testing needs. So don't be shy about reaching out to us in that capacity as well. And so with that, I would like to say thank you very much for joining us today. It was a pleasure presenting for you. And I hope you enjoyed the session and found it useful and interesting. Please reach out to your local Head Acoustics account manager or representative, and we will be happy to continue this conversation in a one-on-one -on -one format where we can really dive into your application, your needs, and your questions. So thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.